Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. How many brought your Bibles with you? Come on. Don't just depend upon the screen. Would you open your, open your Bibles with me to Ephesians, the third chapter, please? Ephesians, the third chapter. In order to fight a battle, you need to know who your enemy is, how to discern who the enemy is. And as I was studying this week and putting together the word, God showed me that God's people don't really know how to fight battles. I've been in a battle for the last two months with my wife. Not fighting her, but fighting the infirmity that was trying to take over her body. And in the process of doing that, I had to deal with myself because it was stretching me. See, when the enemy comes against her, he's coming against me. Because the word says the two shall become one. And God showed me that we need to analyze our enemy, to know who he is, to recognize him. How many understand what I'm saying? So I'm going to read you Ephesians, the, three chapter, the third chapter, verse 17. It's just, I'm, I'm reading out of the Amplified. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And you may having been deeply rooted and securely grounded in love. Touch your name and say, I've got to be rooted. That's another problem we have. We're not rooted. Be fully capable of comprehending what all the saints, God's people, the width and the length, the height and the depth of his love. Fully experiencing that amazing, endless love. And that you may come to know practically through personal experience. See, when you know Jesus, it's a personal thing. It's personal. How many have come up out of the miry clay and God has done a work in your life? And you say to yourself, God, why me? Why am I doing so good right now? I feel spiritually growing and maturing. How many of you could say amen to that? That's good. That's good. And I'm going to share with you even some of my experiences today as I was growing in the things of God. Now, you all know I was a, I'm a retired New York City fireman. But to get to where I had to get from the family that I was in was another task. My family was rooted in the underworld in New York City. You all know that. And the only one that really didn't get involved was my mom and dad. My father was a self-made man, financially stable. Never wanted me to be involved with the family. They always pushed me towards the legitimate things. And I, I just never wanted the legitimate things. The glamour of that underworld life was very enticing. And I mean, I looked at it, and I seen the clothes and the women and the cars and the jewelry, and it was very exciting, only to have the same thing now, but only one woman. I met her when she was 13 years old. Would you believe that? She was a bubble then like she's a bubble now. 13 years old. So my mom provoked me to take the fireman's test. You got to take it. I said, okay. I went down. I was very obedient. I was very obedient to my family, respectful. That's another word we lost in somewhere in the mix. Respect. Children for parents, parents for all the parents. Respect is a tremendous word, isn't it? I couldn't walk into a room without kissing and hugging everybody in that room in my family to love each other and to love them. We didn't even know God, but we still kissed each other. And I took the test. I mean, I was out the night before partying. My mother woke me up screaming at me, you got to go take the test. So I got my car, drove down to the school where they were giving the test. I sat down. The thing was blurry. 
I wrote, I started, I, I, don't th I think I read about 30 questions out of a 100-question test. But see, when God's got his hand on your life and he's directing you in a certain way, how many know that, that, that you're all in process? Come on. When you're in process, God is molding you and shaping you. And there's going to be seasons and storms in your life. And there's going to be times when you feel like you want to give up. Come on. But you've got to hang in there as a child of God. There's times when, 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 when you say, ah, i got to go to church. But when you partied, you didn't have any problem. Come on, think about it. In fact, when you leave church, you're sober. When you want to party the next morning, you still felt the night before. So she woke me up, and I went, I, I took the test. And uh, I remember when I was in college, they said, if, if you're taking a multiple question test, just hit C. <laughs> so I went down the C's all the way down. And, and I passed. I got under 38,000 men took the test that morning. My number was 3,100 and something. I never forget it. 38,000, I came in 3,000. Didn't even want it. Just checked it down. God, God, is, is, God directs and knows how to do things. So now I'm waiting. I didn't even know my wife. I'm, I knew her, but I wasn't dating her yet or, or anything. Not, not when I took the test. No, honey. No, you were a memory when I took the test. <laughs> Good memory, though. Have to be nice. And and I, I remember they called me up and they said you got to come for the physical. True story. Now I knew the height requirement was five foot seven. And I measured myself, and no matter how much I tried to stretch the ruler, I was five six and a half. It don't work. So the night before I laid down on the floor. And I slept on the floor. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to be five foot seven. <laughs> it's a true story. And I went down here, and I, I, I never forget. So it was fully dressed, and it was this long hallway with these open doors. There was a table, and it was five, six women, and they would hand you pieces of paper as you were going in, and they would, they would tell you what to do, and then they'd measure you. And the guy who measured you was a fireman. So he measured me. And he looked at me and says, you really want to become a fireman? I said, yeah. He says, go ahead, go through. Push me through. I know, it's not over. It's not over. So now I get into this room, and everybody's getting naked. All the guys are getting naked. Everybody's naked. God, I didn't, I didn't really want that. I had to go for therapy after that. <laughs> and and, and they're, all, they're all, everybody's naked. And now the guy, you know, he's checking us for hernias. And the doctor looks at me and he says, Are you five foot seven? I said, Oh. I said, I just went through, I got measured. He said, Come with me. He had this long white coat on. I never forget him. He looked like death warmed over this guy. <laughs> and I, 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 I walked with him naked. I followed this guy. Here I am. He's fully dressed, and I'm walking naked behind him. It's a true story. True story. And he brings me back to the measuring thing. But little did he know, across in the measuring thing with the doors wide open, and all the women were sitting at the table. Runs in front of me and covers me. He says, Okay, you're five seven. <laughs> My nakedness made me go through. I gained a half an inch on that. But but 
God works in, in wild ways. Everything in your life is going to have an enemy. He was an enemy that day. But God turned it around. I want to get say amen. Now listen, listen to this. Listen to this. Jesus expected his disciples to stir up enemies. Every time you're doing something right for the Lord or doing something right in your life, you will have an enemy. Can you say amen? amen. Go to Matthew, the 10th chapter with me, quickly. Look at the 22nd verse. Amplified Bible, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who perseveres and endures to the end will be saved for spiritual disease, death, in the world to come. When they persecute you in one town, that is to pursue you in a manner that would injure you and cause you to suffer because of your belief, flee to another town. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant or a slave above his master. It is sufficient for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant or slave like his master. For if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, master of the dwelling, how much will they speak evil of those of his household? You're going to be hated no matter what you do. His disciples for that. We need to be prepared. You're not gonna, everybody's not going to like you. You know, there was a book out, How to Win and Influence Friends. It, it, sometimes it don't work. Come on, somebody. There's jealousy out there. Okay, number two. Jesus instructed his disciples to anticipate enemies. Anticipate there's going to be enemies. Let me read it to you. Matthew, the 10th chapter. You don't have to turn it. I'll read it. Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. Be weary and wise as serpents, and be innocent, harmless, guileless, and without falsity as doves. Number three, never disclose publicly. Listen to me carefully. I believe in not confessing negative stuff. That's one of the things I deal with around me all the time, negative influences that fall from our lips because you could create a circumstance. Don't you think the enemy knows and hears you? He hears when you speak about negative stuff. I go ballistic when I hear negative stuff. Am I tough? Yeah, I'm very tough. I grew up in a tough neighborhood. I came from the streets in New York. My whole life has been tough. I'm a seasoned soldier in the army of God. That's why I look, at, I look at some of the things that are going on in Christianity today, and I say, where have we gone wrong? Where have we compromised the Word of God? Where's the fire of God in God's people? Where's the anointing that destroys every yoke of bondage? Where are people getting set free and delivered? Why? Because we've decided to preach a compromising gospel. There's no compromise in the gospel. It's either this way or that way. Either you're in or you're out. Because the lukewarm, he's going to spit out of his mouth. Be hot or be cold. Stop playing games in the kingdom of God. Become men and women of God. As God, you took the step, get in all the way. Get in all the way. If I serve the world all the way and then Jesus touched my life, I said to myself, I'm going to get in all the way. It is Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He don't change. Why should we change? Come on, church. God's fire wants to come into your life. Once you begin serving the Lord, the fire of God begins to come into your spirit. And you see change happening around you. I see it happening in this church. I see it in my son and my daughter-in-law. I see it in my grandson. I see it in my great-grandchildren. God is touching their lives. 
Oh, God. Never disclose publicly the amount of any damage done by your enemy. Never do that. My. Proverbs 29.10. The bloodthirsty hate and the blameless man, but the upright care for and seek to save his life. Never talk about it. Oh, God. The, uh, uh, constantly. You know what it is to fight a battle like that? An unseen enemy? The battle is in your mind. The battle is in your mind. See, the enemy don't come at you the way you think he's coming at you. He comes at you through your thoughts. He comes at you through the things around you. He comes at you through the failures that you did. He comes at you. He brings the old things in your closet out to show you. Come on. Look at what you were. No, I'm not like that no more. I've changed my address. I'm a new creature in Christ. Behold, all things have passed away. All things have become new. I'm a new creature in Jesus Christ. Somebody shout yes and give him praise. Not the same I was. If I had to be the same I was, I wouldn't be up at this pulpit. Who knew 45, 50 years ago that I would be a preacher and a pastor and a man of God? Come on, somebody. I came out of one of the crime families in New York City aspirations to be one. I would have been dead today. My cousins are dead. My uncles are dead. They're all shot, killed in the street. God spared me. Look down from heaven and say, I want that little guinea. I want that wop. I could say that. You better not. You got to know what wop means. When, 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 when they came over on the boat, and they went into Ellis Island, and they were processed. They didn't speak English, so the, most of the guys that, that interviewed them were Irishmen. And they would say to them, where's your papers? And they would say, no, Piage, I don't know. They'd tell them in Italian, I don't have papers. And they write on the back, W-O-P, without papers. WAP. So you learned something today. About the Italian people. You're going to get no recipes here. <laughs> but I'm serious about this thing about Jesus. I, I'm, how many are serious about this? You got to be serious about this. This isn't a joke. We don't come to church. Oh, give me a latte and I'm out of here in 45 minutes. No, I want to penetrate. I want to pierce the darkness. I want to get into a place where I could worship God in spirit. And it called shaka baba. I want to say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let me be that man of God that I should be. Listen, listen, listen. Your enemy, your enemy is anyone unhappy over your progress. When the children of Israel came and they went to Jerusalem, they were building the wall in the book of uh, Nehemiah. And then in the book of Ezra, they built the temple. And in the temple, they, they, they were, same thing as Nehemiah, they were getting problems from the Babylonians and from the people in the land that, they, that, that had occupied Israel at the time. In Ezra 4, 5, it says, and they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose and plans all the days. Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. The Persians were doing that constantly, provoking them to stop the work of God. The enemy is jealous. He led worship in heaven. But pride was found in him. And it was cast out of heaven. But he knows exactly when you're worshiping God what you're going through. When you're worshiping God, you're burying all your thoughts. When you're worshiping God, you're forgetting about all the scars and the things you came out of. When you're worshiping God and you're lifting your hands, you're not concentrating on how bad you are. You're concentrating how good God is and what he could do in your life. Could you say amen and give him praise? See, the enemy hates that. He wishes he could do that. He wishes he could worship God. But in his character and in his, his finite nature, he can't do that. 
It was embellished into his life that he could not worship God anymore the way he was supposed to because God labeled him. But God didn't label you. You could fall, get back up, brush yourself off, and get back in the race. Just say amen and give him praise. Come on, how many got back in the race? Come on. Oh, my God, somebody shout yes and give him praise. How many got back in that race? You're a child of the living God. Fight the good fight of faith. He's a child of God. Woo! Mm. Okay, here's a good one. Here's a good one. Here's a good one. Your enemy is the door, not the wall, to your next season. You, th you, think, you think the enemy is there to deter you? Sometimes he don't even know what he's doing. He's preparing for you. Your setbacks are set up for your comeback. Come on. How many can say amen? Oh. You put a door in front. You put a wall in front of me. That's not a wall. That's a door. Because through it, you're maturing. The children of Israel, when they were coming out of captivity in the book of Exodus, and you can read it yourself, okay? God could not take them the short way. He had to take them the long way to the land of the promise. Because if they went the short way, they would have not persevered. He could have took, I mean, at one part, at one part they could have practically jumped across the Red Sea. But God didn't bring them that way. God told Moses to bring them the long way. Okay? Because he wanted to create in them obedience. He wanted to create in them character. Some of the things that you've gone through, learn it as a lesson, as a stepping stone to be a person of obedience and character. Come on, God did You're not like the world. When the world messes up, they fall on their face. When you mess up, God reaches out and lifts you up and gives you what you need to go on to the next step to your destiny. Could you say amen to that? God's people don't understand that. Oh, God, it's, it's over. No, it's not over. It's never over in God. You know what I kept telling that woman? This too shall pass. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. Uh -uh. Oh, you want me to go and talk about that, Mommy? Now, some of you don't even re remember the Berlin Wall. How many remember the Berlin Wall? The communist Wall separated east from west in Berlin. Well, I went across the wall twice when I was in the army. First time I went across because we had to bring some papers over. Second time, yeah, I was in the army. Some of those memories I don't want to remember. And the second time I went across the wall, it was five of us, me and four other guys. We went across the wall, and there was a scientist defecting. And we had to take him across the wall. And we got across cool. We were in civvies. If we would have got caught, they would have killed us immediately. We couldn't wear any uniforms. And I, we got across, and we met him. We brought him back, and on the way back, a Russian guard cut us off, and we got into a firefight. And I emptied like three, four clips of my forty-five. I shot, I, I don't know how many people I shot, but I, we shot. We finally got him over the wall. The enemy was always there for you. God's taking you over the wall. How many want to get over the wall? Ooh, come on, church. Mm. He was a defect. He defected. He was a scientist. He defected from, from uh, Russia. Anything good always has an enemy. Anything good always has an enemy. Now, here's something hard for you to digest, and we're going to close in a couple of minutes. Listen to me carefully. Loving your enemy will create a great reward. That's tough. You know how many enemies I've had? You can line them up. 
In fact, I've been shot in the back so many times. If I drink a glass of water, I leak. But think about that. But I got rewarded. Seven, eight years ago, we had a situation in the church. I told all my leadership, no recourse, no retaliation. Let them do whatever they want. And out of that, we were blessed. We came through it. Come through this. I was going to share with you the seasons. Next Sunday, I'm going to share with you the seasons in your life through the Word, through the landscape of God's Word in the book of Timothy. We all go through our seasons. How many, how many have gone through some seasons in your life? But if you're wise and you're smart and you're in the Word, you don't have to go back through that season. You don't have to do it. The wise man learns by his mistakes. Could somebody say amen? Okay, listen, let, let me read it to you. Go to Luke with me. Luke 6, 35. Last scripture verse. But love your enemies. Be kind and do good. Doing favors so that someone derives benefit from them. And lend, expecting and hoping for nothing in return, but considering nothing is lost and despairing of no one. And then your recompense, your reward will be great, rich, strong, intense. Oh, I love this. Abundant. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind and charitable and good to the ungrateful, the selfish, and the wicked. Somebody say amen. amen and give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can I read you one more scripture verse? Okay. Your enemy is a natural and necessary part of your life. Say it again. Your enemy is a natural and necessary part of your life. You think you're going to blow through this life, tiptoeing through the tulips? You're in the wrong place. Expect this to happen because instead of it destroying you, it enhances you and gives you, come on, character in your life. Tell me you don't learn by some of the people that came against you. Come on. You learn. Let me read you that scripture. It's in John, the 15th chapter. Go, go with me. And this is the last, I promise, the last one. Look at the 18th verse. It says, if the world hates you, Know that it hated me before I hated you. If you belong to the world, the world would treat you with affection and would love you as its own. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Hanging out with the world, if they like you, something's wrong. Oh, my God. I mean, you got to remember, I was in the firehouse. My uh, firehouse was the third or fourth busiest firehouse in New York City. All the guys in my firehouse were crazy. They were lunatics. We didn't even dress like everybody else. Okay? And when I got in that firehouse, I became like the instigator. I was the social director. I'm serious. That we drink every 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 tour. Guys would drink, they'd bring two cases of beer, a bottle. I mean, everybody would drink. It was it was party time because we ran 20, 30, 40 runs a night. Maybe four, five, six working fires. Our lives are on the line. So we lived on the line. When I got saved, <laughs> when I got saved, I, I came in the kitchen, my Bible under my arm, stood on a chair and said, everybody in this room is going to hell. And they threw coffee cups at me and everything. <laughs> I had a religious spirit. I had to learn. I used to walk out to the front of the we said in the summer we'd open the doors and guys, you know, the traffic back and forth in front of the firehouse. And I would sit there and, and the guys would sit out in front of the you know, in between runs and in between eating and whatever. I, I used to walk out in the front because I was saved. They'd all go in the kitchen. I'd go in the kitchen, they'd go out in the front. I'd go up to my bunk, there'd be a blow up doll in my bunk. I walked in the kitchen, and they pasted on the back wall, all penthouse, all the naked women, 
on the back wall as I walked in. I looked at them. I called, they knew I was a tough piece of work, so I called. I grabbed about three or four of them. I pulled them in. And I said, would you do this to your mother and your wife? And they, they, they put their heads down. Now listen to me carefully. Because I held my ground, two, three o'clock in the morning, I'd hear one of them slide the pole and come into the house watch because I'd be reading my word. He'd say to me, would you pray for me and my wife? And I never said to him, I'd like to break your face for what you're doing to me. I would bow my head and pray for him. One of the guys who was the biggest instigator, he loved my son, Joe Fitzpatrick, the biggest instigator in the, in the firehouse. So him and I were very tight. When I got saved, he cut me away like, forget it. All right, he used to just drive me crazy. He put, he, he put shaving cream in my boots. And, I mean, he would do everything, rocks in my bed. I mean, come on, just to irritate me. And I would just love him. Joe, I love you, Joe. And he cursed at me, came to me, 4 o'clock in the morning. He says, my wife's in the hospital. She's got alcoholism. She tried to commit suicide. Would you pray for her? And I grabbed his hand at that point and prayed for Joe's wife. And the next day, they released her from the hospital. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Prayer works. The love of Christ works. It works, church. One more story. Can I tell you one more story? It was New Year's Eve. And I would work New Year's Eve so I could have Christmas Eve, Christmas off. I would work a 15-hour tour for a nine-hour tour. And when I came into the firehouse, we had a covering officer. We had a driver who was a green driver and two other guys some of the real rebel rousers in the firehouse. And I would do the house watch from 6 o'clock until like 2 in the morning, 2.30 in the morning. Then I'd wake the guy up that had the 12 to 3 at 2.30. And he would wake up at 3 to 6 at 4 or 5 o'clock. So I woke the guy up, and he was drunk. They drank all night. They were drunk. And I got into bed. I remember he came down. And we, when you get three rings on the, on the phone, that means you're going to work in fire. Meanwhile, it's five degrees out. It's New Year's Eve in New York City. It's so cold that you can't even breathe. And a box comes in, three rings, and we, we, I, I, turn, I, I didn't hear him turn the company out. The lights didn't go on. So I slid the pole. I went in. He's dead asleep in the house watch, like this, on top of the house watch book, box, book. I turned the company. I turned the lights on. All right, the officer slides a pole, the chauffeur slides a pole. The other guy is in bed upstairs, dead asleep. Both of them drunk out of their mind. We take in the box. As we turn the corner a few blocks in the firehouse, the sky is lit up. We pull up in front of this building. It's blowing out of four windows. I'm all by myself on the back step. So I, in other words, you take three folds it's one length of hose. I took six folds, pulled it off the rig, and stretched into the fire. They gave me water, and I started to hit the fire, but I was beside myself. In the back of my mind, I was saved at the time. In the back of my mind, I said, I'm going to go back and kill these two guys. Okay, because we could have lost life. Not only their life, my life. So second due company pulled in, and they helped me, and Finally, we put all the holes. The holes were so, it was so cold, the holes froze. We had to bend it like we were bending a cardboard box to put it on the rig so we could take it back and defrost it. When I got back in the firehouse, I took an inch and three-quarter line. I told my son this story. And I hooked it up to the hydrant in front of the firehouse. And the guy was still sleeping in the house watch. And I opened it up and blew him out of the, out of, out of the house watch. Went upstairs, the guy was in the bed, I dragged his bed down the steps, put him on the apparatus floor, and blew him out of the bed. And told the both of them, I love you, but if you're in this company tomorrow morning, I'm going to break your kneecaps. You need help. You need to go for help. 
bolted and went and got help and got rehabilitated and began to get healed from alcoholism. True story. True story. I mean, I've seen things you, you can't believe. I've seen men blow their wives in half. I've seen people run around the street with knives sticking out of their ass. They sieged our firehouse one night. I worked the night they killed Martin Luther King. There was 22 bullet holes in our rig. I've seen it all. But there's nothing like being in the presence of Jesus. There's nothing like giving him all the glory and all the honor. How many received this today? Would you stand with me right now in the name of Jesus? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just lift your hands right now. Come on. I need the worship team up here quickly. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So much. So much of what God has to do. So much for the body of Christ. So much the anointing that destroys yokes of bondage. We need the fire of God in the body of Christ. The day of Pentecost was cloven like fire on the heads of each believer, 120 in that upper room. The devil wants to keep you in a pit. Wants to keep you tied up in your, your coulda bees and your woulda bees. But God wants to set you free. God wants to break the chains that are holding you. So that when you walk out of them, you can hear them fall behind you as a child of God. God wants to do that work in your life. God wants to give you the power to speak to that which is not as though it shall be as a child of God. God wants to give you an anointing in your life in the name of Jesus that would speak to things as they should be and God would answer you. A prayer of faith will save the sick. Come on. A prayer of faith will heal and set people free. A prayer of faith from God's people. How many want that in your life? Lift your hands if you want it in the name of Jesus.